Hi everyone! Today I'm going to be doing a fairly quick unscripted video. This is a bookshelf tour. I have not done such a video for a very long time, but if enough people are interested, I should like to continue doing installments in this series. Now, actually, my previous bookshelf tour video is linked to this because that was my um, walkthrough of religious Jewish books, which are currently in my possession. And those books were all current, or I'm mean, sorry, formerly stored in this plastic crate, which you see in front of me. And the books piled on top of it were also in the crate, but I, I obviously took them out and put them on my shelves over time. And I'm just basically going to be going through the, there aren't too many books in the crate, but there are a few of them. And obviously we're going to start with the books on top. First up is a collection of science fiction short stories on the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, the greatest science fiction stories of all time, edited by Robert Silverberg and chosen by the members of the Science Fiction Writers of America. And it has, you know, a couple of the big names you would expect. Isaac Asimov, who is one of my favorite writers, Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein, you just, Ray Bradbury, just all the great names you could pretty much think of. I don't remember how this came into my collection. It doesn't have a, like a sticker for the price in it. So I'm thinking maybe it didn't come from a used bookstore, like a mass make, map market paperback would suggest. So maybe this was one of those books, which was originally in my father's collection. I just took it with permission when I was older and expressed interest in it. My father absolutely loves science fiction, and that's my um, secondary genre. I absolutely, of course, love, I live and breathe on historical fiction, but I also really, really enjoy science fiction as well. As I just said, Isaac Asimov has been one of my favorite writers since I discovered him when I was 11 years old in the fifth grade. Next up is a book which gets a lot of love here on BookTube, The Brothers Karamazov by um, Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky. And unfortunately, I DNF'd it when I finally sat down to read it a couple of years ago. This was a birthday or Hanukkah present for my surviving uncle. I believe I was like about 24, I think, if I had to guess. I specifically asked him for this book, and particularly the David Macduff translation. And he did, you know, get me the book I wanted, but for whatever reason, I just never got around to reading it. And when I finally picked it up, I mean, like four, three years ago, whatever, I just, it was not, it, I'm sorry if I'm rambling or like not coming up with a words. It just was not what I was expecting at all. It just seemed kind of like dry and boring and slow moving. And in all these notes, like, why do I need to constantly look back? I mean, obviously you don't need to look back, but it does interrupt the text anyway when they're saying, oh, maybe I should look back. I don't know. And it's just, oh, this is explaining a line to something in the Bible or whatever part of Russian history, like, is it really that important to the story that I need to know right now exactly what this is referring to? And I really, it was kind of put a bad taste in my mouth from the beginning when he's like, oh, you can't understand these characters or their story unless you know their complete backstory. So I'm just going to do like a, a two dozen pages of backstory info dump telling me they're telling you their entire lives before I actually finally get to the inciting incident. And from what I understand, the book doesn't even begin with the inciting incident. It takes like 300, 400 pages for it to finally get there. But, you know, maybe I just wasn't, wasn't in the right frame of mind, or maybe this wasn't the right translation. After all, I did kind of ask for this translation for a kind of shallow reason, because I liked his transliteration style. If you saw my recent video about Russian names, transliteration and pronunciation, you know I'm totally pedantic and nitpicky and a stickler for a certain kind of transliteration, the more like modern letter for letter style instead of the old fashioned kind or the kind of like quote unquote translates names. But I would like to pick this up and try again at some point in the future. I only got up to page 73. So, you know, sometimes it just takes like a different stage in life or a frame of mind or whatever. And a book that you put aside is like much, much better to you. Hope maybe that'll be that way for me too. I also did several um, previous videos um, discussing this book a little bit, but not like in depth, the, uh, the video which was only about this book, this is on Boris Leonidovich Pasternak's one and only novel, Dr. Zhivago, for which he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1957. And I have a previous video where I'm reciting his heartbreaking poem, Nobel Prize from 1959. It's just like really, really a sad story how he was forced to like say, I can't get this prize because it would mean leaving his beloved homeland. And he was very old and I believe that he was all or so already sick with his final illness by that point. And there are you know, many reasons this has been a, a difficult book for me to read because it's obvious he was a poet first and foremost. He just wasn't a novelist and he's making all these things which I don't necessarily consider mistakes. They're just when you're a, like a newer writer or like an amateur or not, you just don't know how to write a novel yet, you haven't had much time to develop your craft. You just do things like, oh, I'm going to run into these characters 200 pages later not because it has like importance to the plot or character development, more like, a, hey, 
how are you doing? I'm just reminding all the readers you still exist. And even though it had absolutely nothing to do with anything, it just like so many other things about this book just feel like maybe if he had lived longer or written more novels over his life, he would have been a much you know, stronger writer for this particular book. But again, it's not a book I would recommend you not read. It's just, just keep in mind he was a poet first and foremost. And this really isn't, you know, one of the most greatest Russian novels of all time. This is a book which I believe I got at one of the book stalls at the Carrot Festival one year. That's a, like a really, really huge Jewish community wide event at the um, Agudat Achim Conservative Synagogue in Schenectady, New York. All the area synagogues come together and they just have little booths and stuff like hawking like food and jewelry and used books and used clothing and all sorts of really fun, cool, interesting stuff like pillows, like tableware, just anything you could imagine. Or it also might have been a used book sale at um, Agudat Achim. I really can't remember which one, but you know, like just about everyone of my age or like many, many generations, not confined to just like late Gen X, like I read the entire Little House series by Laura and Gales Wilder but several times. I can't remember how many times exactly when I was a, a preteen and even before I was a preteen, maybe like seven or eight, I first started reading the series. And so this is a really nice way to have it all in one volume. You know, like, like who didn't read that series growing up or even watch the TV show from the 1970s and I believe it continued into the early 1980s. I did see a lot of the episodes in reruns when I was younger but obviously they're not like so close to the book in fact they even make a lot of stuff up like for example giving Laura and her sisters a brother who never existed they did have a brother but he died in very very early childhood I think he was like 18 months old or something like that so they just like made up so much stuff I could do a whole like video ranting about that but you know it's really nice to have all the books in a series together in one volume and this is a coffee table book about one of my favorite animals, frogs. You might have seen a, another coffee table book about frogs in my one of my recent videos showing photographs of my old bookshelves when I still lived back home in Albany, New York. But that book was just called Frog. This is Frogs. Uh, you know, they're not my like, favorite, favorite animal. My two absolute favorite animals, my spirit animals closest to my heart are spiders and turtles. But you know, like frogs are like, probably in the top five. So I just absolutely love them so much. I would love to have some you know, pet frogs someday and all this like or gorgeous beautiful photography of frogs you know who could resist that and just part of it is like I could never understand why so many other girls and women act like oh frogs are so gross and creepy and that's only for boys and you're supposed to run away screaming if you see a frog why they're so beautiful and cool and fun and I absolutely love when I am taking a walk or in the backyard or something I just see a cute little frog or toad hopping around or hanging out in the, the, the community cat's water dishes or just like a little puddle of water. Oh, cute. I'm going to take a photograph or just like talk to it or hang out for a while. You know, an animal lover, you kind of do that all the time. And so like, why would I be afraid of frogs or think they're like scary or not for girls? That's just such a stupid sexist myth. This is another subject which has been very, very, very close to my heart almost my entire lifetime. I've absolutely loved silent films since I saw The Great Metropolis from 1927 by the great German director Fritz Lang when I was about 11 years old. PBS used to show it very, very, very regularly back in the day, so I probably saw it several dozen times in the fifth and sixth grade. And after my political awakening when I became a socialist when I was 15 years old, it meant even more to me after I saw it again after that like profound political epiphany. It was just like an obvious story about the struggle between the haves and the have-nots and the capitalist fat cats exploiting the poor like proletarian and the working class and the poor factory workers. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful film and I was lucky enough to see it for 35 cents at the um, Sunday afternoon matinee at the Madison Theater back when I still lived at home in Albany, New York. And this is the back cover of it. I have seen almost 1,300 silent films today. I began keeping a list and I'm very early. I'm 2000 five when I had still seen, you know, enough films and recorded the rest in my journal that they were obviously like fresh in my memory. I could look up the rest on the like DVD anthologies with like, you know, collections of short films of Charlie Chase or Laurel and Hardy and things like that. So I was able to, you know, get the list up and running before I saw like way too many films to all know like right off the top of my head or like look through my the pages of my journals to find out about. I cannot recommend silent films highly enough. I would Love to do some more videos on this beautiful art form at some time in the future, as well as books based on it. Like, for example, the, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which was 
one of the best like book to screen adaptations I have ever seen to this date from 1921, which gave my favorite male actor of the silent era, Rudy Valentino, his big break. It's just like, and so many other wonderful, wonderful books, which were turned into films, including several other films, which Rudy acted in. They're just, you know, so many, I just can't say enough about silent film. Can you tell when I start rambling about a subject, it means I'm really, really passionately interested in it. And if I ever do have enough, like, you know, subscribers, active subscribers to do and ask me anything, I would love to talk some more about my um, favorite actors and favorite films and stuff from the silent era, as well as the early sound era. Just, you know, I just absolutely love classic films so, so very much. And I do have an index of film reviews on my main blog, and many of those are silent films as well. So I, I can't say enough about how much I love silent film. And this is, I picked it up. I don't think I, I maybe I did buy it or just like someone gave it to me on one of my um, previous Israel trips. It's about the city of Petra in Jordan with all these like wonderful, you know, antique, not, yeah, yeah, ruins from antiquity. Just, you know, one of those places I would absolutely love to go and see someday. I really, really love archaeology and ruins and ancient history and just like wonderful, really cool stuff like that. And, you know, like world travel, just thinking about like, who are these people who built these amazing buildings and who are the people who lived here and the people who like, you know, just came through throughout history, all just thinking of their hopes and dreams and like what kind of world they lived in. It's just, you know, like kind of gives you goosebumps a little when you just think about, you know, the history of the human race and we're never really as di mistily distant from the past as we like to think we might be. This is one of the things which I found in the desk when I used to work for a local Jewish newspaper. The person who had been worked there as a proofreader before me had left a bunch of little booklets and really like odds and sods and like some really interesting stuff like measurement tools, pocket dictionary, things like that in his or her desk. And I got to keep them all when I was um, laid off from work. There were a lot of um, financial troubles, unfortunately, so they had to let a lot of the staff go. But I really, really did enjoy working there. And one of the perks was I got to keep all of the stuff that was in my desk because they obviously had no use for it. And this doesn't even have anything to do with a newspaper. These are the selected letters of D. S. Ash Wander. Just, I think, yeah, he, he was kind of like had some mental illness, and these are like the like scattered, scattered ramblings within his mind. Just like really, I mean, I don't want to make, I'm obviously not making fun of this person. It's just like this was kind of like written out as a product of mental illness on the back. It says, I'm the man, the late President John F. Kennedy referred to as, we have control of the mind. I have a cosmic mind going out into the universe acquired by separating a gold soul from my head in 1953 and having an electroshock treatment in 1959, which electrified my mind and body and sent my cosmic mind, partly neutron radiation, out into the universe at the end of a press conference in January 1961. Later, the CIA flashed through my cosmic mind, Albert Einstein spitting in my face, Jesus Christ being crucified on a cross, and John Foster Dulle smiling. For a donation, I will heal you of your sickness, and you will be rewarded in heaven or paradise. And he gives his address at the back in Alabama, like 308 East Azalea Avenue, Foley, Alabama. You know, it's just, it's interesting what you find in a desk when you, like, inherit someone's old possessions they left behind when they used to work there. The next bookish thing in this crate, again, most of what's left in here are not books. This is a gift my brother gave me. I believe it was for Hanukkah many, many years ago. It's called, um porn for women it's just pictures of men doing housework and stuff like that obviously it's a play on like oh women aren't really interested in the the traditional pornography men are they're more interested in like emotional stuff and things like that you know it's not really the kind of book I don't think I would have picked up for myself but it was you know fun and cute obviously that was years before he disowned me in an abusive misogynistic fit of rage because I don't go along with his you know, like political group think but you know obviously that's a long story for another topic the next bookish thing in here is a sweet little picture book which my grandmother made for me i would guess about 1983 judging from the pictures inside a, a picture visit to grandma's house in the winter both of my paternal grandparents have now gone to their paternal home my grandpa passed on in august of 2005 and my grandma passed on in um, april of 2014 and i missed both of them very very much i teared up when i went through this book about six years ago i i guess maybe i knew it existed but i guess i just hadn't seen it or been reminded of it in a very long time and just looking at these pictures and seeing my grandmother's handwriting it just like made me miss them very 
very much and like you know seeing how their house is it used to be in the throwback of the old like polaroids or like photographs back when people actually used like film cameras and it wasn't just like digital stuff oh if i don't like that photo or it didn't come out properly oh i can just erase and start over no you have to just like go with what you have with the film camera and if you messed up a picture you know that's just like too bad and this is um, obviously in the winter so you see the the snow outside with me you know, like grandpa shoveling his car i do have a previous video talking about like my pittsburghese dialect and using dialect in your own writing that's one of the uniquely pittsburghese terms i use i call my grandfather's grandpa but i don't care who thinks that makes me sound like a hick that's just you know how i have always talked like it or not you know you can't control the regional like dialect you pick up from birth and when, when you're socialized the last bookish things in this crate are some of the yearbooks from my old elementary school, public school number 16 from Albany, New York, in the Pine Hills neighborhood. Sadly, that building was torn down many years ago, and along with it, the playground, which the students, myself included, worked so hard and were so proud of building in 1985 and 1986. We did not have a playground when I started kindergarten there in 1985, believe it or not. So they just like, like ripped it all down to build a, a, a brand new like school with no personality or charm, just you know, like out with the old, in with the new. I really, really don't like new architecture, but obviously that's a whole thing for another topic. But they were like a really cool, like sweet reminder of the world that was. Pine Hills was my favorite neighborhood in Albany. I loved it. It's very, very strongly working class and lower middle class character. And I posted, I, I took pictures of the many, many pages in the yearbook and posted them on Facebook six years ago. And so many people were so thrilled to see them and people like who I wasn't Facebook friends with, they were tagging their, our mutual friends and even some teachers and everyone was coming to see them. Oh, like I had no idea I was in this like club. I totally forgot about this or wow, I looked so young or oh, OMG, you look you're like someone said, so, like someone was telling a, a mutual friend of ours, oh, your daughter is like your clone when you were the same age. And it was just like a really fun trip back down, you know, happy memory lane for everyone, just that yearbooks are for everyone. And I just think it's kind of sad, not all elementary schools, like they don't have yearbooks. Some people think, oh, it's just for high schools, but it's just really, really fun. And also something really, really amazing came out of that experience of posting all the photographs online. I finally found a, an old friend I hadn't seen since the eighth grade. I've been, you know, looking for her for a very, very long time on Facebook. I just, you know, wanted to find out what had happened to her and like, catch up with her because like her friendship really, really meant a lot to me in the eighth in the seventh and the eighth grade when I was getting bullied. I'm sorry if I'm speaking too fast yet again. I'm not 100% comfortable on camera. And so anyway, I finally found her. The reason I hadn't been able to find her because she's one of those women she didn't have her original birth surname and her Facebook name was just her married name so obviously I had no idea what her married name was I wouldn't have known to look for her by that name and then she was really happy obviously to get back in touch with me and she told me in a DM I had never realized I had this kind of influence on her she said my refusal to recite the creepy daily loyalty oath to the flag in elementary school it always stayed with her and now that She's a teacher herself. She doesn't do the creepy daily loyalty oath to the flag either. And she gets some like weird looks and comments from students and other teachers. But, you know, I really influenced her to do that and made her think this is a really creepy ritual. Most people in most countries of the world do not do this. And I, it was even creepier back when it was accompanied by the Bellamy salute, which I'm not going to like demonstrate. It's like really, really looks like the Nazi salute, just a different name like that it's just so freaking creepy and i'm just really really glad i my refusal to take part in that jingoistic ritual like had a a, a positive influence on somebody you like you never know what you're putting out or like how people are going to be like inspired by what you're doing thank you very much for watching hopefully this video wasn't too rambling and all over the place as i mentioned at the beginning this video was completely unscripted and if enough people are interested in this hopefully i will be doing some more bookshelf tour videos in future, including hopefully when I finally get all my books out of storage 900 miles away and finally have them back in my physical position. I can't wait to get reacquainted with them and see them again after like six years being so lonely and so far away from their rightful owner. And if you enjoy content like this, please um, consider subscribing if you haven't already and hitting the notification button so you can know when I upload new content. And again, a comment means so much more to me than a like because it lets me know you watched all the way through and just like want to have a conversation and be friends with me and I will see you guys again very very soon thanks for watching bye